Dragon Day is one of the most important American films of our time. Back in the early 2010s, when Hollywood was stuck in the past, releasing boring, dated movies like The Artist, a film that barely even had any talking in it, visionary, groundbreaking director Jeffrey Travis was looking into the future. He saw where the world was headed, the problems that would surely arise in the coming years if we weren't careful, and he wasn't about to just let it happen without warning each and every one of us. He didn't have time to watch a movie that couldn't even afford Ford Color, he was too busy saving our lives. Most of you were just too stupid to realize it. The first time I saw Dragon Day, I knew my life would never be the same. You see, it's not just that the film is a fact-based, non-biased, completely clear window into the inevitable future of mankind, it's also one of the most entertaining experiences you'll ever have in your pathetic lives. In Dragon Day, all havoc breaks loose and you're forced to survive. And that's where your real colors show. So how many times do our neighbors become our enemies all of a sudden when in normal life we were very kind to them? So I think it really challenges an individual on a deeper level from that perspective. Also just the awareness of cyber war and the reality of what's happening right now in news. This film has it all. It's got thrills, it's got politics, it's got a loving family fighting for survival, and it's chock full of racism. I purchased the DVD from Amazon.com, which is where I normally buy all of my movies. I wanted to get a copy of the Blu-ray and was heartbroken to find out that the film has only been released on DVD in America. There is a European Blu-ray under the alternate title Invasion Day, but I don't even know how much $32.99 italic ease is in normal money, and I didn't want some pansy ass non-USA version of such an important film. So I did what any good American would and I bought the DVD, made right here in the greatest country on the planet. If you have a problem with the resolution of the clips in this review, well, that's just your lack of patriotism talking. There's no sense in wasting any more time, let's talk about this masterpiece. Dragon Day takes place in California in the near future. We are warned from the film's opening shot that Dragon Day is only 72 hours away. Ethan Flower plays Duke Evans, a family man, an all-around true American that was just laid off from his job with the NSA due to the current fiscal crisis. We learn from his BFF and co-worker Phil that he was one of the best goddamn design engineers they had in the NSA, and if it wasn't for these government budget cuts, he'd still be protecting this great land. Somehow Duke's family home is in foreclosure, even though he was just let go within the last three days. Don't you hate when that happens? His grandpa also recently died and he needs to go speak with his sister about the will. Things couldn't get much worse. Before we get too deep into the story, I need to mention just how important the characters are to this movie. Any bum off the street can write the single most important thought-provoking screenplay of our generation, but it wouldn't matter if the audience didn't care about the people on screen. Dragon Day is filled with layered, realistic people just like you and me. It'll be tough, but I'll try my very best to describe them with as much detail as I possibly can. Duke Evans is our lead. He's happily married to Leslie Evans and is the father of Emma Evans. Aside from his family, there isn't a single person on God's green earth that he cares about and trusts more than his buddy Phil. He's former NSA, a real smart boy, and he can't get enough of taking electronic devices apart. His wife Leslie loves her family. She, uh, uh, she... She gets real worked up real easily. What else? She, uh, uh, Their daughter Emma loves her family. Almost as much as she loves being told stories. She also gets really bored really easily. Rachel Evans is Duke's sister, and she loves her brother and his family. She also has a car. She, uh, uh, that's, uh... That's about it. Albert Grimes is a neighbor of the Evans family's late grandfather. He hates communists almost as much as he loves guns. He's always willing to lend a helping hand, even if you didn't ask and you really don't need any help at all. 
He's also a huge racist. The last of the main characters is Alonzo Benavidez. He's Mexican. Where were we? So Duke and his beautiful white American family are driving to a small town to meet up with his sister Rachel at their late grandfather's secluded home with the intention of moving there. When they stop to get gas, his wife attempts to get money out of an ATM but gets an error. Meanwhile, Duke learns that the card reader at the gas station is down as well and they are only accepting in cash. God, could this day get any worse? The family arrives at the house before Rachel does and decides to look around, wondering amongst themselves if they could make living in such a small town work, seeing as their house was foreclosed upon in the three days since he lost his job and they are homeless already somehow. Emma turns on the TV but all that's on is a boring news program about how the US owes trillions of dollars in debt or something, so she decides not to watch it and walks away. The family is settling in when Duke notices something moving around in the closet right as Rachel arrives. Hey, everybody, let's uh, go outside. Now, everybody. Why? Outside? I'll tell you outside. Come on. Instead of telling everyone why he forced them outside, he changes the subject and suggests that they go into town to get food. Rachel volunteers to go and takes Emma with her. I don't know. It's not... Oh, sure, it'll be fine. I'll be back soon, but, uh, not too soon. What's the matter? Is it Rachel taking Emma? Because I don't completely trust her either. Yeah, I was worried about my sister taking our daughter into town, which is why I let us all outside and put the pieces into place that would allow that specific thing to happen. What a stupid question. Duke calls 911 about the potential intruder and a short time later, the only two officers in the entire town arrive. The police go inside the house and return with a Hispanic man in handcuffs. No dice nada. You have the right to learn English. After a conversation I understood about 20% of, because I don't remember much from the three and a half years of high school Spanish that I took, and the movie refuses to subtitle anything, we learn that the man's name is Alonzo. He was hired as caretaker for the property, and he has been living there for quite some time. The police can't kick him out due to a quote-unquote binding oral agreement that he had with the grandfather. The argument is cut short when a passenger plane flying overhead crashes in the distance. Oh, no. oh my god. No. Holy no. shit. Oh, no, no. Get in the car. Now! I guess that Alonzo is part of the group now, whether they like it or not. Are we going back home? Sure. It'll be a pretty drive. A truck pulls up and nearly runs Duke and his wife over. It's Arthur, the crazy old neighbor. You may be wondering why he decided to show up at their house out of the blue. Arthur is a red-blooded, God-fearing American that cares about the well-being of his neighbors. That's why. If not that, then it's just the beginning of a large string of plot devices. Uh, you look like the spitting image of your grandpap Jack. Thanks. Yeah, he was a uh, ugly as sin. <laughs> They notice there has been another crash before Duke starts putting everything together. At shop today, cash only or were the card readers down? Down, just like the ATM they ate my card. It took your card? Yeah. Get inside, everybody. Everybody, get inside. Now! And cut! Duke tells his wife to call her sister before he himself calls his butt buddy Phil. When he doesn't get a response, he leaves a message instructing Phil to call him back as soon as possible. It's ringing. Having been employed by the NSA, Duke is a man that knows how to remain level-headed under even the most extreme pressure. Is there a landline out here? I don't know. Is there a landline here? Anywhere, hurry! I don't know what's going on. Look for a phone, now! Is there a phone in here? Maybe in here. Nope, just a ridiculous amount of potatoes. My fellow Americans, this afternoon, as many of you already know, had an unprecedented and cowardly attack on the United States of America. It is clear that this has been a determined and coordinated attack 
of a magnitude never seen before on American soil. We must remain. Oh no! Phones. Now! ¿Qué estás haciendo? Hey! Telefono! We can't let them know where we are. Oh no. Rachel's car dies and her and Emma are forced to walk. Leslie is freaking out hard, worrying about her daughter, and Duke tells her he will go and find her. I'll follow you! Wouldn't it be easier to ride along with him instead of taking two vehicles? Or, I don't know, just go back home? Why are you even here? How lonely are you? Damn it. Good thing Arthur came along and brought his own vehicle because it's old and it doesn't have computers in it and it still works. Yay. They run into the police, who are also having car troubles, and the officers demand that Arthur hand over the keys to his truck. Please, sir, step out of the vehicle. Uh, officer, my shit. daughter is missing. Get out of the vehicle now! My girl's out here somewhere and we need to go and find her! Hey! I got 19 other emergencies bigger than yours right now! Hey. No, you can't have it! Evans, my daughter! Evans, step out of Whoa! Ow. I thought you had 19 emergencies to take care of. I guess the 19 emergencies could wait while you drove these men to jail. Watson, you took my truck, you son of a bitch! You son of a bitch! The next morning, Duke and Arthur are released from jail. The police chief has a word with Duke before he lets him head home. This looks like war. You agree? Huh. It looks that way. The question during war is, who can you count on? Who's on your team? What is that? Safety. It is explained that these wristbands are needed to obtain rations and pass through checkpoints that have been set up. Listen, I got two more of these. One for your wife, one for your daughter. You got a decision to make. You better do it now, pal. Arthur gets a rifle from his house and Duke returns to his house. At this point in the film, Emma and Rachel have found their way back home. Alonzo and his friend, who is only in the movie for two scenes because he has a horse that Alonzo needs to borrow, went and heroically rescued the young girl last night. I didn't feel that it was worth mentioning in detail earlier because the scene's only purpose is to make the Evanses stop hating him for being Mexican for just a little while. It doesn't work. They kick him out of the house shortly after. It's been 32 minutes and we are more or less right back to where we started, with everyone back at the house. The second her father returns home, home without questioning if he's okay or where he's been, Emma asks if he can tell her a story. She loves her a good story. The second act of the movie consists of people sitting around complaining about how hungry and thirsty they are, cut in with scenes of Duke taking apart electronics. This act also features one of the biggest info dump scenes I have ever seen in a film. You smart CIA types know what the hell's going on here. Well, based on what I've seen so far, there's really only one thing that could be happening. Uh, those damn commie pinko ruskies, they're back. Duke explains what he did in the NSA, what hacking and cyber attacks are, and describes word for word in great detail exactly what is happening to the country. As a microchip engineer, I looked for weaknesses, vulnerabilities, I wrote scenarios. God damn communists. You know Kennedy should have wiped those Russians out when he had the chance. Pretty sure it's not Russia. China. Yeah. Why would China do this? Debt. We've borrowed trillions of dollars from China over the last decade to keep our economy afloat. Now theirs is in trouble. My guess is they tried to collect and we couldn't pay. So they're repossessing our country? <laughs> every plane, every piece of communication equipment, every GPS unit frozen, except for maybe some of the very old devices. They've set the clock back 50 years for us. How? Uh, still doesn't make any sense. All these chips can be accessed over a secret wireless network. How could 
did you know this? I wrote a simulation on cell phone chips showing how it could be done. Duke makes his way over to Arthur's house. Arthur is sitting on his patio with a rifle, keeping a lookout for looters, yet he didn't bother to lock the door to his home, a door that is behind him and hidden from his view. Holy shit. Yeah. How the hell do you figure that flag? I mean, what is it? Some kind of Chinese shit flag, huh? What? That night, the Evanses are around the dinner table, and Leslie has another one of her classic freakouts. Look at your daughter! You're not here, and you're never here! Of course he did. So we're just gonna pretend like he had an infinite amount of wire laying around? Sure. His middle school science fair project actually works, but he's still unable to get a hold of Phil. Duke claims for the first time in the movie that there is a bunker 40 miles away and that they just need to get a hold of Phil so that they can be safe. Phil has all of the answers to all of their problems. God, Phil is so great. If only Phil were here, we'd be eating ice cream sundaes and singing Christmas carols to newborn puppies. If only Phil was here. As you probably already guessed, the next stretch of film is just Duke trying to contact Phil some more, and his family complaining about how hungry they are and sitting around looking bored. Where'd you get these bracelets? You know, the sheriff gave me those. They're some sort of pass for buying food. Duke? Cool. Now you tell us, why don't we use them? There's just something that's not right about them. No, don't! What's the harm? I don't know, just... Don't. Something finally happens when one of the cops shows up at his door, the less racist one. The officer lets Duke know that the rations have shown up and they are available in town if you have your wristband on. Dozens of identical boxes, all labeled for the sheriff's substation. County. This movie doesn't make any fucking sense. The entire idea the film is built around, an idea I will admit is somewhat interesting in concept, is littered with so many plot holes and is told in such an idiotic way that I'd argue the film is even worse than if it didn't try at all. The movie claims that China is retaliating against the United States because we refused or were unable to pay back over a trillion dollars in debt. That is why this takes takeover is happening. It is stated in the film that them lending us all of this money has taken a serious toll on their economy, and it is implied that this is a major reason for the drastic measures they have taken. Please, explain to me then, how in the fuck they have accomplished this plan of theirs? Let's ignore the coma-inducing logistics of it all, the fact that packaging up and shipping hundreds of millions of boxes of rations and wristbands would take way longer than a day or two. Let's just focus on the staggering cost of it all. How much would you imagine 300 million high-tech wristbands cost to manufacture? How about 300 million boxes of rations? How much would you imagine it would cost to ship everything from China to every small and large city in the United States? Getting back to the wristbands, China would have had to have created a team to design these things. Where did they get the funds to accomplish any of this? We have a trillion of their dollars. Dollars. So much of their money, in fact, that their economy is collapsing. We've borrowed trillions of dollars from China over the last decade to keep our economy afloat. Now theirs is in trouble. Yet they have a spare fuckzillion and three dollars sitting around to orchestrate this impossible plan of theirs? And it worked? No. We're just over halfway through the film and I simply do not care anymore. Rachel puts on a wristband because why the fuck not? Welcome, new citizen, Rachel. It knows who she is somehow. These wristbands are so fucking high-tech that they can tell who you are by you just putting them on. Sounds expensive. Duke hears gunshots coming from over by Arthur's house. He runs over to find that Arthur has been murdered by looters. Luckily, these looters missed the clearly visible pistol in his waistband, and now Duke has a gun. The looters are on their way to Duke's house next. No. He somehow manages to make it home before the looters get there, without them seeing him, despite the fact that he falls and loses his gun along the way. 
Luckily, the police just so happen to arrive at the perfect time before anyone can get hurt. They line the looters up and execute them one at a time because times have gotten pretty tough. Before heading out, the sheriff informs the group of a new 3 p.m. curfew. The next day, Rachel decides that it's the perfect time to go into town and get rations. After walking a short distance from the house, her wristband starts to beep. It starts to shock her, telling her it is past curfew and she needs to return home. Instead of, I don't know, taking a couple of steps towards the house so she'll be back within the acceptable boundaries, she instead stays in the same spot and eventually gets electrocuted to death like a fucking moron. Also, this isn't her house. She's just visiting it like everyone else. So how does this wristband know when she's inside or outside? Or where she is supposed to be? Or how far from the house she is? The wristband technology must be really expensive. In the next scene, Duke is burying his sister and just so happens to find the gun that he dropped. Ugh. Duke. Do you have any food or water? No! Emma is basically dead at this point, so Duke decides it's as good a time as any to finally tell her that story that she's been asking for. Did I tell you a story? Once upon a time, there were three little piggies. He stops telling his dumb daughter her stupid story because his best friend in the whole world, Phil, is finally responding on the radio. China has claimed the US. Millions are dead. We need you, Duke. You're the best goddamn NSA agent there ever was. We're coming to get you. The military shows up that night to pick him up. Much to his surprise, they only have orders to bring Duke with them and not his entire family. Duke refuses to go because he's a gentleman who would never leave his family behind. The military's like, okay, that's cool, and they leave, but then they come back a few seconds later and they're like, just kidding, you actually have to come with us right now. And then they forcefully put a wristband on him and drag him to their vehicle. No, 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 oh, no, no, ah! Come with me. Cat! Cat! Pretty nice. Hey, an actual Chinese person. Yeah, I'm right. Phil? Look, you may not believe me but I really am trying to help you, right? Wearing this red wristband does not mean that you're on the wrong side. You fucking traitor! Do you understand why we allowed this? Project Zulu, Maryland. It was a research contract, a simulation. Yeah, a simulation for the real thing. A virus embedded into every single one of these microchips, which pretty much shut down the entire country. You wrote it with that hand right there. You typed the code. have to reboot the system when the system is crashing. Deactivation Did you think that this country's multi-trillion dollar debt was just gonna go away? Phil hands Duke a computer and tells him the back door for the software is getting in the way and demands that he fix it. Phil is sitting on the opposite side of the table, unable to see what Duke is typing, but assumes that he will do what he is told, on a computer with no administrative restrictions, because if he had any common sense and acted like someone who really worked for the NSA, this part of the story wouldn't work. He is so trusting that when he gets the computer back, he doesn't double check anything. He just glances at the screen, closes the laptop, and leaves. I mean, it is implied that if Duke didn't do what Phil told him to do, his family would be harmed, but the NSA released him and his family without even making sure he actually did it anyway. The Evanses return home and see that Alonzo has returned to get some of his belongings. What are you, what are you doing here? 
he is leaving to go back to Mexico. The sheriff shows up again at just the perfect time and tries to steal some of their rations. You're still here? You know, the only thing we're sharing these days with illegals is our bullets. Get on your knees. On your knees! Alonzo asks them to go to Mexico with him, even though they have disrespected him the entire film, and they agree, even though they have acted like they hate him the entire film. They drive through the town and witness what has become of their once picture-perfect country. It isn't until they have reached the Mexico border that Phil finally decides to check the laptop and realizes that Duke added three more back doors and the program is all messed up. You can tell from the way the scene is presented that you weren't supposed to have guessed that Duke screwed him over, but I mean, come on. Duke's wristband starts beeping and won't let him leave the country. Good thing he packed this chainsaw for the trip. He gets his hand cut off and then they escape through the border fence. <laughs> wow, Mexicans have families just like normal people. The end of the movie, we shot for a day down in Mexico. These people that live there, um, they, you know, go through the t trash to find, uh, to sell whatever they can find. Duke is definitely, absolutely, without question, missing his hand, but at least now his family can live happily ever after in Mexico with the guy they treated like trash the entire film. With all of the chaos behind them, there's only only one last thing to do. Once upon a time, there were three little piggies. Dragon Day is a train wreck. Aside from the film's central invasion concept, the entire movie is nothing more than a series of run-of-the-mill predicaments used to fill up the runtime. It adds worthless characters to the story for the sole purpose of having additional bodies to get into conflicts, and doesn't spend any time allowing them to have characterization. It expects you to care about and root for paper-thin protagonists that make stupid decisions and treat others with disrespect and bigotry. People come and go, only being around when they are needed to drive the narrative forward, and are completely forgotten about or ignored when it isn't their turn to be on the screen. The screenplay is very robotic and unnatural, every single scene being connected by a chain of plot devices. This has to happen so that this other thing can happen, and then that can happen. The writing clearly is not the only problem. The acting is horrendous from everyone except Scoot McNary, and I'm in no way implying that Scoot was was good in this, just that he's been good in other things and he was the least terrible here. I'm sure that you noticed how fucking ugly the color palette is. The film would have looked so much better without any color grading at all. Instead, it looks like actual barf, with orange and red tints over everything. I guess that the film isn't an exercise in utter incompetence like, say, Demon Tongue. It does have some production value, the sound is passable, and there are no glaring editing issues. I didn't want to turn the movie off every second it was on so that's something too. But I mean, is a film not being totally broken a positive? Should a film be rewarded for not being the absolute worst thing ever made? There isn't anything here to appreciate or enjoy aside from the concept, a concept that wasn't fully realized. Dragon Day doesn't do anything innovatively terrible, it just has one of the stupidest stories in the history of motion pictures and fails at everything that it tries. When it's all said and done, what made the biggest lasting impression on me was the film's message. Mexicans and Americans can get along, as long as we keep the sneaky Chinese away. One out of ten. Sometimes I can only get a hold of Phil somehow. Oh.